Hi. Why are there electrodes on my base? Oh, sh so, um, my bridge just fell out. I didn't even know it was a floating bridge. It has been said that I have the cleanest tone in the game. Yeah, it's basically like a poor man's Ebo and an even poorer man's air compressor. Welcome back to another episode of Levi Does Some Incredibly Stupid and Potentially Destructive Things to His Very Fragile and Expensive Instruments. Make sure to subscribe for more of whatever the heck this is. This video is sponsored by me. Him. Go check out my Patreon in the link in the description. Today we are sound designing on the bass. I'm gonna try out a few different extended techniques and see if we can create something neat, cool, unusual, not sure. As we try them out, I'll give you my thoughts about each one and then I'll give it a rating out of 10. All right, let's get into it. Extended technique number one, prepared bass. This is a technique adapted from John Cage's prepared piano. This involves taking things like these piano mutes and alligator clips and putting them in between the strings to get some neat new sounds. I've also placed a few contact mics so I can do some body percussion on the bass itself. The mutes basically divert the string in a really interesting way, which highlights different partials and these strange overtones. And it gives the bass kind of more of a gong sound or at least like it's going through some sort of weird ring shifter. Check it out. This is Norwegian composer Bjorn Fongard demonstrating his prepared guitar for NRK TV in 1971. He's widely considered to be the first person to ever prepare a guitar. The story goes that in his early years, he was intent on building a microtonal 24 tech guitar that would help him build out a framework for his ideas involving a quote, universal principle of tonality. Somewhere along the fret modification process of his Framus Model 5131 Hollywood, he realized he could radically alter the timbre of his guitar with implements, just like Cage had done some 20 years beforehand with his prepared piano. After this realization, he partly abandoned his theoretical microtonal work in favor of focusing on the prepared guitar. And you know what? Hey, if it worked for him, maybe it'll work for me. Let's try it out. So uh, my thoughts. The highlight of this technique is definitely the gong sounds with the mutes. I think that's probably the only sound that I could see myself legitimately using in like a sound design context. I think the contact mics and the body percussion was uh, honestly a little bit mid. There was a lot of behind the scenes studio wizardry that was necessary in order to make that sounding, you know, like halfway decent. So uh, it's 10 times easier. And honestly, you'll get a much better sound if you just use like actual percussion instruments or even percussion VSTs. No need to redesign the hammer if it's gonna take you a lifetime just to build a, a slightly worse hammer. I did like that it switched up my playing mindset a little bit. I wasn't really thinking of it like a bass, but more so as a drum, which is pretty neat in terms of creativity, I guess. That being said, I'll give the prepared bass a seven out of 10. Extended technique number two, vacuum bass. So this one is, uh, a little weird, but I've had experience with this. I first had the idea to play the bass with the vacuum when I saw this video by Jaden Chavez, who does these duets with the wind. And yes, you heard that right. When I saw it, I made a video explaining the physics behind how it works. And I wanted to demonstrate the oscillation that happens when you exert a constant flowing force onto a vibrating string. But it wasn't windy that day, so I had to improvise. And it turns out that you can simulate this with a vacuum, sort of. This particular vacuum has an in-out feature, so I just flip things around so I can blow air out instead of take it in. So it's basically like a very weak air compressor. I've seen shoegaze guitarists use actual air compressors to get this kind of droning sustained effect. So let's try it.
So I actually think it's a really cool and unique sound. I will say that you have to be very still and very precise. And even then moving around the fingerboard too much disrupts the momentum of the vibrations. So you actually have to avoid certain notes. Yeah, it's basically like a poor man's Ebo and an even poorer man's air compressor. And, and not to mention it's like really loud. Like you're hearing the sound of the pickups, um, but I'm hearing that. Also, I don't know if my vacuum is broken or something, but it gets really hot really quickly, so it becomes really uncomfortable to hold after just like a minute. I'll give this one an eight out of 10 on sound because it actually sounds pretty good, but a two out of 10 on ease of use because it, it's just kind of torture to play. To be honest, it's not a fun experience. Would not recommend, just buy an Evo. Before we move on to our last technique, I have one honorable mention that I already know is horrible. seen classical guitarists do this and I, I don't know if there's an actual term for this so if there is please drop it in the comments basically you take one string you put your left hand finger underneath that string and grip the neck string up and then you bend that string down and cross the two strings over each other this creates a very similar gong effect to our mutes but with like triple the pain. Absolute zero out of 10 on this one. Just let the guitarist have it. There's no place for that technique when your strings are as thick as these. If you want to get the gong sound and you don't want to hospitalize your fingers, just go for the alligator clip. It's nice, easy, and simple. And by the way, it works really well on an upright. This video is sponsored by me. If you want to support my work on this channel, the best way to do that is through Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you'll have access to all my sample packs, extended cuts of my videos, and behind the scenes materials. I also have tiers like exclusive microtonal music theory lessons, perks like getting your name in the credits, and hangout sessions where we can talk live about anything and everything music. I hope to see you there, and now let's get on with our final extended technique. Extended technique number three, the Koto effect. This one probably falls under the category of prepared bass, but I think it's special enough to warrant its own examination. I've heard this called the third bridge technique. Essentially, you take an implement and bisect the speaking length of the string at some point. This divides the string into segments called the front tone and the back tone. You can play on either side of it and experience a similar sound to a Japanese koto, at least when done on guitar. I haven't yet seen anyone try this on a bass, so let's give it a go. interesting conceptually, because if you think about it, there's a reciprocal relationship that exists between the front tone and the back tone. So if you place this third bridge where the 12th fret harmonic is, there's a one-to-one -one relationship embedded within the bitone. But if you move the bridge up or down the neck, you effectively seesaw the proportions and get to explore different ratio relationships between the two sides. When you pluck one side, the opposite side will resonate in a subharmonic. And if you place the bridge in harmonically consonant positions, like where the seventh or fifth fret would be, you'll find that the resulting multiphonic tone is distinctly pronounced and clear. That's due to reciprocal string resonance and a bunch of ear math making things louder. All that said, I think the best part is the bends. I mean, I play bass, how often am I bending things? I think at the end of the day, this technique is one that suits melodic instruments with higher registers a bit better. But still, I found it really inspiring. And of course, it made the tuning theory nerd inside me real happy, so I'm gonna give it a six out of 10 on sound and a nine out of 10 in experience. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it brought you some value or maybe even inspired you to try out some of these extended techniques. I'd also like to shout out my patrons over on Patreon. To borrow a line from a certain 
non-specific public broadcasting station, this channel is made possible by contributions from viewers like you. And I really mean that, like, the more patrons we get, the more videos I can make. The link to support the channel will be in the description and the pinned comment. If you like this video and you're a fan of weird esoteric music theory or sound science or honestly me just destroying my instruments some more, please subscribe and be sure to ring that bell because there's much more of all of that to come.